the journey to the axiom of exceptionlessness. There is a certain arbitrariness in choosing where to start any story. Uh, so I am uh, starting with Marcus Zuerius von Boxhorn, who lived from 1619 to 1653. And um, he's a, a at least as reasonable a starting point as, as anyone. He proposed that Dutch, Greek, Latin, Persian, German, Slavic, Celtic, and Baltic languages all descend from a common source. And very importantly, he thought that this common source was not Hebrew. At his time, following biblical traditions, there was a tendency to try to derive uh, living languages from other living languages, in particular from Hebrew. So in, uh, in instead proposing uh, that living languages uh, descended from, from, from something else, from, from a language which is no longer around, uh, he anticipated the reconstruction of proto-languages. And also his, uh, his choice of, of related languages is correct by our standards today in terms of isolating the Indo-European languages as opposed to uh, other languages. So the next stop in our journey is Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz. 1646 to 1716. He's famous uh, for, for many reasons, including being together with Newton, one of the joint founders of calculus. So he divided the languages of Europe into, into three groups, depending on their word for God. Uh, you see Germanic has uh, words for God that start with a G, Slavic words for God that start with a B, and Romance uh, words for God that start with a D. For our purposes, What's important about his contribution is that he correctly identified Indo-European subgroups uh, using some explicit criterion. Now, uh, the fact that this particular criterion got him the right answer, uh, I think, was to some extent uh, just luck. Uh, but it also shows that that sometimes the signal is just so strong that even using... Um, a method that uh, would now be considered quite coarse can lead to the right answer. In other words, spotting these three language families was relatively easy. So now moving on uh, to William Jones. So uh, William Jones is uh, where many people begin the story of historical linguistics. He was a judge in India, a polyglot, as someone knowing Greek and Latin. Uh, when he learned Sanskrit, he was really struck by how similar it was uh, to Greek and Latin and um, and how beautiful and well-structured it is as a language, uh, something that you know, I think anyone who has studied those three languages can only agree with. So he, he really drew attention uh, to Sanskrit, and it turns out that knowledge of Sanskrit makes the study of Indo-European much easier. So now I will just uh, give some evidence for that. So here we're looking at Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit verbs, in particular, the verb to bear or to carry. So uh, I'll just read this paradigm out loud, yeah? So uh, first person singular, pharaoh in Latin, pharaoh in Greek. Of course, originally it would have been pronounced pero, and then barami in, uh, in Sanskrit. So then second person singular, fares, feres, barasi. Uh, then third singular, fert, uh, fere, and barati. Just notice the S in the second singular, the T in the third singular in both Latin and Sanskrit. The long vowel in Greek, ferro, uh, cognate with the long vowel in Sanskrit, barami. So there are just many, uh, many similarities uh, in these paradigms. Uh, I, I won't talk through uh, the other two numbers. Anyone who had learned these three languages would be naturally inclined to compare their structure. Uh, and it turns out that Sanskrit provides a nice model for exploring the structure of Greek and Latin. And this uh, research agenda of using Sanskrit as a sort of key for um, uh, analyzing the comparative morphology of other Indo-European languages was taken up by Franz Bopp, 1791 to 1867. So he systematically studied uh, the comparative morphology of uh, Indo-European languages. 
and can really be, I think, uh, considered the founder of uh, comparative and historical linguistics. So now the next stop in our journey is Rasmus Rask, who lived from 1787 to 1832, so quite a short life. Uh, and he discovered what later came to be called Grimm's Law and showed uh, also that Avestan was an Indo-European language, Avestan, the sacred language of the Zoroastrian religion. So now I'd like to uh, present Grimm's Law. So I'll, I'll put it uh, together a piece at a time, sort of uh, starting from some specific components and then uh, moving towards a more general statement. So to start with, Indo-European P becomes Germanic F. I use Sanskrit and Latin, which come from quite different um, parts of Indo-European, to exhibit this. So we have Pitar in Sanskrit, Pater in Latin, Father in English. Pada in Sanskrit, Pes in the nominative, and Pedis in the genitive uh, in Latin, and then Foot in English. Piscis in Latin, fish in English, urna in Sanskrit, plenus in Latin, and pull in English. So pretty, pretty good evidence that uh, a P becomes an F in Germanic. Next, an Indo-European T becomes a Germanic th, written with uh, theta in the IPA. So we have tri in Sanskrit, Trares in Latin and three in English. Tvam in Sanskrit, two in Latin, thou in English. Hut in Sanskrit, that in English. So again, uh, pretty good evidence that uh, Indo-European T becomes Germanic th. Indo-European K becomes Germanic h, pronounced h in English. So we have kephale uh, in Greek, kaput in Latin, where the the letter C makes the K sound, and head in English, cardia in, uh, in Greek, cors uh, in the nominative, and cordis in the genitive uh, in Latin, and heart in English, kuon uh, in Greek, canus in Latin, and hound in English. So that's the evidence uh, for K turning into H. And now we see P changes into F, T changes into Th, K changes into H. So altogether, we have voiceless stops becoming fricatives. Now I'm, I move uh, a bit faster, only give one example for each specific change, and then move to these more uh, general switches of manner of articulation. So we had uh, stops becoming fricative. Now we have voice stops becoming devoiced. So uh, B becomes P. Uh, for instance, Latin labium becomes English lip, D becomes T, so uh, Sanskrit dashan, Latin decem, uh, we get English ten, G becomes K, Latin gelu uh, gives us English cold. Uh, so those, those examples show that the voice stops uh, become devoiced. And then we have murmured stops becoming voiced. I give Greek here, but it, but in Greek the the murmur stops were, were devoiced. B becomes b, for instance, barati in Sanskrit, pero in Greek, and bear in English. D becomes d, madu in Sanskrit, metu in Greek, both meaning honey, and then mead, a uh, alcoholic beverage made from honey in English. Uh, G H. So g becomes g, stignoti in Sanskrit, stekain in uh, Greek, and German steigen, which means to climb or yeah, climb, step up. So putting these three sort of overall changes together, we have d becoming d, d becoming t, t becoming th. So murmur stops becoming voiced, voice stops becoming voiceless stops, voices stop becoming fricatives. It's as if uh, each manner of articulation moved one over in some game of musical chairs. So that's a generalization that's extremely broad and takes in a lot of details about the development of Germanic. And now, with Grimm's Law in place, we have a tool 
whereby we can weed out promising but false proposals. So if you just prima facie look at English have, uh, is it cognate with Latin habeo, meaning exactly the same thing? They look so similar, must be related, right? Uh, but no, English H comes from a K, as we've seen, whereas Latin H comes from a GH. So they can't be cognate. And instead, habeo is cognate with English give, and English have is cognate with Latin capere. I think that's a nice result, right? We, we have a generalization, and then if we believe our generalization, we can use that generalization productively. But there are some exceptions to Grimm's law, and um, that's what we'll look at next. So Carl Lautner, 1834 to 1873, who I so far have been unable to find a picture of, and if you have one, please uh, let me know and send it to me. Uh, in an article in 1862, he cataloged all of the known exceptions to Grimm's law. And one point I uh, want to make in this presentation is what a service to science that is. In the rat race of academia, there can be too much emphasis on trying to produce new results or use new methods. Well, here is a guy who just systematically collected uh, evidence in a tidy way. And that is not an activity that gets a lot of glory, but is uh, enormously beneficial to the progress of science. Uh, so two of his readers were then able to uh, find patterns in these exceptions. Uh, so one was Hermann Grassmann, 1809 to 1877. So he uh, solved one of the classes of exceptions to Grimm's law and then is also known uh, as a great uh, mathematician. So here is Grassmann's law. First, let's look at uh, at the the Exceptions. So we have grbnati in uh, Sanskrit, cognate with grab in English. Now, the problem here is the G in Sanskrit corresponding to a G in English. We should have a GH in Sanskrit corresponding to a G in English. And then uh, in another example, we have bodati, cognate with pothomai in uh, Greek and bid in English. And here the B in English should have a BH as its cognate in Sanskrit. So Grossbaum's proposal is that both in Sanskrit and Greek independently, if you had aspiration on either side of a vowel, the aspiration was lost from the consonant before the vowel. So we have grab uh, becoming grab, uh, so the G de-aspirating. Uh, and then bud. Uh, becomes bud, uh, so the b de-aspirating. Just to make clear, this hypothesizes that in Indo-European, everything works, right? That So Indo-European had g, h, r, b, h, and then that gave us the g in Sanskrit through Grossman's law and the g in English through Grimm's law. And similarly, Indo-European had you know, something like B-H-U-D-H, uh, and then that uh, becomes B-U-D-H in Sanskrit through Grossman's law, and it becomes B in English through Grimm's law. There were still a few exceptions left for Carl Werner to solve. So Carl Werner was 1846 to 1896, and in an article in 1877, he solved uh, the remaining exceptions. So Werner's law is... It's tricky, and it's easiest to remember using uh, these two kinship terms. So the regular development we have is brata in Sanskrit, brothar in uh, Gothic, and uh, brother in English. Now, English actually collapses the distinction that uh, Gothic maintains, so we, that's why we have to turn to Gothic for the Germanic forms here. We're looking at the medial, so we have a T in Sanskrit becoming a, a th in Gothic. But then um, in the word for father, uh, the T in Sanskrit becomes a D in Gothic. Now, what Werner noticed was that the placement of the accent was different in these two cases. So uh, in the word for brother, the accent in Sanskrit is before the T, 
And then in the word for father, the accent in Sanskrit is after the T. So we can generalize that Grimm's law does not apply in stops that come after unaccented syllables. Now, I'll just point out that Werner's law explains uh, what's called grammatische Wechsel in Germanic, and, I, and, I, and, and this phenomenon is extremely marginal in English. It's, yeah, it's really, really marginal. Uh, there are only these two examples, uh, but I give them was and were, is and are. So you want to know what is this S in the singular, R in the plural, alternation about, well, just notice that it's predicted by the placement of the accent in Sanskrit. So we get S changing into R when the S follows an unaccented syllable. So Werner's law is extremely impressive because it's connecting the development of consonants in Germanic with the placement of accent in Sanskrit. So Werner's achievement in solving the remaining exceptions to Grimm's law was extremely impressive. And two people who were impressed were Karl Brugmann, 1849 to 1919, and Hermann Osthoff, 1847 to 1909. And then they founded a, a school of thought called the Neogrammarians, where they said that this result, namely that a sound change has no exceptions, is just how sound change works. So that is called uh, the neogrammarian hypothesis, uh, although it's probably more accurate to call it the neogrammarian axiom uh, because it creates a research program where if we find exceptions, we have to explain them. So uh, this axiom is that sound change uh, is phonetically conditioned and admits of no exception. Now, apparent exceptions then can either be explained by more sound change, more refined conditions to sound change, by borrowing, or by analogical developments. And I won't talk about borrowing or analogical developments today. Instead, we will rest content uh, that we have completed our journey towards this uh, neogrammarian axiom.